Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Spine Health Foundation. I'm your host, Erica Anderson, today for our uh, monthly Facebook Live interview. And I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Tom Walters of Rehab Science to speak with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Walters. Totally. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on. And the spine is a huge passion of mine. So uh, I'm excited to chat about it a little bit. Yeah, it's kind of like anything you do in within healthcare and specifically physical therapy, obviously very connected to the spine. And so um, we're so happy to be talking with someone today who's done some great work in that area with so many people. Um, before I jump into all of my inquisitive questions, I would just love to hear a little bit about you and sort of your professional background and what led you to where you are today. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, I, uh, I've been a orthopedic physical therapist for 13 years now. It seems like it's gone really fast, but I uh, originally, you know, did my undergrad in exercise science. Uh, um, I'm from Montana, so I did that at Montana State University. And then I went on and did the DPT, the Doctorate of Physical Therapy uh, in Southern California and uh, finished that in 2007. And then when I got out of uh, physical therapy school, I pretty much have spent my whole time, I really had a passion for orthopedics the whole time. So and especially, I really started out in the beginning in manual therapy. So I did a residency in orthopedic manual therapy. So I really used my hands a lot uh, to work on people and then pair that with exercise. And, you know, we can talk more about the evidence around those things as we go. But, um, you know, I still kind of integrate those things quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, over the 13 years as a PT, I've been in orthopedics pretty much the whole time. Uh, different, you know, sometimes outpatient orthopedic clinics, you know, smaller clinics, uh, I've done a little bit of traveling physical therapy around the U.S. I was a PT for Cirque du Soleil for a while. Um, and really the last eight years, uh, I've run a cash-based PT clinic uh, and I've taught full-time uh, as a kinesiology um, professor at a small college uh, in my town of Santa Barbara. So I just left that position a year ago. So really I'm kind of back into full-time clinical work and doing a lot with rehab science and sort of online physical therapy which sounds a little strange but um yeah that's well, kind of my days. background yeah <laughs> these exactly. days it doesn't exactly. sound strange yeah. um so yeah. i would love to just hear sort of what gave you the passion to pursue this career because um it seems like something you really love and it's really it's so great when you get to actually do something that you love for your career so what gave you the desire to pursue this pathway yeah yeah, it's interesting. I uh, love it more now than I did when I got into it. And I liked it back then. But I think like a lot of people who are a lot of other physical therapists, I know I was an athlete, uh, you know, in high school and before that, and I had surgery, you know, went through knee surgeries and things and went through the rehab process. And I think that introduced me to it at first. And then when I was in college, I really, um, was just really sort of became obsessed with anatomy and physiology and that sort of academic content. So I was really looking for a career that would sort of tie my athletic background with anatomy and physiology and um, also allowed me the balance to pursue other life things that weren't just purely academic. So mm -hmm. PT school was a good fit for me rather than medical school and other things. So I, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got here. And I, I, I mean, I love it. I think people get that sense from what I do on social media and things, because, you know, I just love talking about it. I love uh, educating. I, I think, you know, just, um, I love seeing people who, who are in pain get better. And I think, you know, an education is such a important part of that. So um, yeah, it's just, I feel, I feel, I've, like you said, I feel very fortunate to be doing the thing that I'm so passionate about. And so quickly, I was going to ask you about Cirque du Soleil, but you brought it up already. So tell me how that worked. Like, how did you get that job and how cool of a position to be able to take? Yeah, it was an, it was a really awesome position. It uh, They have uh, on each of their shows, you know, they have resident shows and traveling shows. And each one has around three sort of rehab practitioners, uh, a combination of athletic trainers and PTs. And so it's a pretty extensive uh challenging sort of interview process. I think it was around a three hour interview, something like that. And they really look for people who have backgrounds in sort of both acute sort of um, on-site sort of medicine like an athletic trainer would normally possess. And then 
you know, my background in manual therapy was attractive to them. I didn't actually have much of the athletic training background, but uh, yeah, I went through this interview process and I, it was a really, just a cool position. I spent part of the time in Vegas and then I really was hired for a show that was in LA for a while. So I went to Montreal to create all their shows there. So I treated the performers. Our show was called Iris. It was a history of cinema. So it came to LA and, oh, cool. um, but it had mainly dancers, uh, former Olympic gymnasts, trampolinists. And we basically, the, the performers would just sign up for treatment and they could get worked on every day, uh, however much they wanted. And we just basically kept them healthy and were there at shows in case something were to happen. So That's yeah, really, really cool neat position so yeah yeah that is really neat well i want to transition to sort of what you're doing now which is rehab sciences i don't know if that's just one of the things you're doing but i would love to talk about in terms of your patient demographics what um what are some of the main problems people are coming to you with what do, what do you see most often yeah uh the demographic i see just for your listeners, I think will fit most people. Uh, I tend to see adults and I mean, some maybe high school kids, but it, it probably is in that, um, you know, sort of 30 to maybe 70 um, age range and people with just sort of more common um, aches and pains, orthopedic type things. But, you know, I think when people come to see me, the most common issues that we end up seeing are like the spine pain. So low back pain. We, I think most of us know now how common low back pain is. And so I see a lot of low back pain, neck pain, um, lots of pain at the front of the knee. We call it patellofemoral pain. Uh, you know, lots of rotator cuff, uh, what people just call shoulder impingement. Um, you know, so those uh, Achilles tendinopathies, uh, tennis elbow, things like that. Mm -hmm. So really common. And I think that's why my social media work is popular because it's it's addressing conditions that are so common throughout the population yeah. so, and around the world. So now, yeah. do most of these conditions are they related to injury? Or are they more just you know sort of things that happen with age or genetics? Mm -hmm. Most of them, I would say, are most of the people that I'm interacting with and seeing are less. Uh, they're not usually traumatic things. I mean, there are some of those where someone has a real acute trauma, but most of the time they're more sort of, you might think of as sort of the repetitive overuse type conditions that are associated just with the time of doing something or maybe with people not moving a lot and, you know, maintaining sort of static postural positions. And so they tend to be, uh, you know, conditions where we're not really so much worried about some tissue being damaged, but the person has pain and it's trying mm -hmm. to work through the complexity of pain, especially when you get into the spine, pain get, can be so complex. So um, yeah, so it's more of that kind of stuff, kind of maybe overuse, repetitive kind of pain conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know, a lot of times when we're talking with people, we wanna get sort of some basic information. So mm -hmm. you obviously know a lot, you're a professor, you're a doctor, um, but in terms of sort of some of the basic tips you might give someone uh, in terms of a prevention, um, of g getting those injuries, and then B, in terms of recovery. Um, mm -hmm. And once you have one, you know, how do you smartly do that process of recovering? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we always try to talk about uh, reducing the likelihood of injuries because prevention is never foolproof. You know, you can't fully prevent something. Things right. just happen. You trip off a curb and sprain your ankle. It's hard. You can do everything out there and still have an injury but there are a lot of things you can do to help reduce your likelihood of injuries and you know i think the big ones uh you know are gonna be things that are taught uh, i'm glad to see being talked more about in the research now but things like adequate sleep you know i think the, the sleep uh, issue is coming up a lot and we've seen lots of studies in athletes where reduced sleep reduces their musculoskeletal performance and reduce and increases their risk of injury so that happens in the normal population too, but things that maybe people wouldn't necessarily associate with physical therapists like me, but, you know, sleep, um, you know, thinking about the person's nutrition and maybe, uh, you know, getting the right sort of breakdown of macronutrients. Am I thinking about, uh, are maybe some of my things, my diet pro-inflammatory? I think we're seeing more and more talk about just inflammation in the body and um, how can we, especially when you think about pain, you know, if it's, if it's a trauma like spraining your ankle, maybe those things don't matter as much. They 
could on the recovery side and healing. But when it comes to just nonspecific pain, I think considering the inflammation in your body uh, and how that's affecting your nervous system is really important. Uh, you know, and then exercise, just basic general exercise. It doesn't have to be really complicated. You know, sometimes with the spine, uh, for instance, people are always talking about these really complicated core exercises and really just basic walking in many <laughs> cases uh, has the same evidence for really complicated core exercises. So, you know, and we see more and more research with aerobic exercise. So if people can jog or cycle or swim, uh, sustained aerobic exercise helps to reduce inflammation in the body. So that, you know, I think can have an effect on uh, pain and things and recovery. So, you know, a lot of those things are both uh, reducing the likelihood of having uh, pain or an injury and also would help on the recovery um, side of it. I talk a lot in my account, if somebody does have a musculoskeletal injury, the evidence is usually best for resistance training, better mm -hmm. than stretching, better than balance work, you know, and those things can play a role for sure. But resistance training where you're lifting a load, maybe it's body weight, that that type of exercise tends to have the best evidence for reducing injuries in the musculoskeletal system. So you can kind of think of it as if you're lifting weights, you know, and it could be bands, dumbbells, whatever it is, that resistance improves the capacity of your musculoskeletal system. So your tendons get stronger, your ligaments, the discs in your spine, your bones, and if all those things are stronger, you're less likely to suffer an injury. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't need to be, you don't need to be lifting, you know, 30 pound weights on each side, like a small amount is good enough. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we used to think, we used to think more along the lines that it had to be really heavy. And we're seeing more now that resistance training can also be effective. If you have a lighter load, you just do more reps. You also can increase, you know, the capacity of your tissues too. I think we tend to try to get people in the finding a, a weight that they would get tired somewhere in the maybe eight to 15 repetition range. That seems to, across these different studies, that seems to be a good amount. You get tired in that range, you have a load that's sufficient enough to really increase the strength of your tissues. Um, I just lost my train of thought, but I'm gonna get it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that happens just, to me a lot. <laughs> yes, um, I was just gonna say, I had a question on the tip of my tongue, but I'm gonna move on to the next one because I can't remember it. Um, yeah. uh, oh yes, this is it, got it. Um, in terms of listening to your body, you know, so much like you're saying, like walking, you know, basic mm -hmm. stuff is really, you know, sleep, hydration, all of these things mm -hmm. are so basic. And yet a lot of people maybe don't do them or avoid them and don't, or don't realize that. And one of the most important things I've been told or understand that we could do is listen to our body. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of listening to your body and how do you listen to your body? Yeah, that's a great one. I think there's so many people that are just not really aware of what their body's telling them. And I mean, it's, I'm not perfect at it either. I think it's a constant sort of evolution. And, you know, for me, for instance, I've recently come to realize, um, just, I, I've really spent more time recently sort of paying attention to my sleep. And for a bit of time, I was using one of the wrist trackers and looking at how it was affecting sort of my recovery and things like that. And alcohol, you know, things like that, like just how much alcohol would impair my sleep. And so, you know, I'm evolving too, and sort of paying more attention to those things. And I'm 38 now. So I am thinking maybe it's getting older, I realize I need to pay more attention to my body doesn't recover as well as it used to when I was 25. So you know, I think, um, you know, a lot of times for me, and maybe this helps other people, I like to think of it like my body's an experiment. And so there's a lot of variables in life. And so it's not easy to control all the variables like a, you know, a, an experiment like scientists would do. But I think we can take one variable in life and manipulate it and change it a little bit, just change one at a time and see how that affects how you feel and your performance and things because really how we our, our perception of how we feel i think a lot of times is a good indicator of how we're how we're doing and what our health is like so you know uh maybe you just uh you manipulate your sleep by an hour you add an hour of sleep and you do that for a week or two and just sort of track and i think a journal sometimes a journal can be really useful because these changes are slow mm -hmm. and gradual and we all know if there's something really gradual uh you might not notice the day-to-day -day changes but if you look back oh, two weeks or a month we do this with pain all the time because pain can change really slowly. And, uh, so true. you know, and, yeah. So I think thinking about your body and your health is 
in an experiment. I mean, not being, that might sound a little weird, but you know, you're just manipulating well, a variable and sense. change it in sort of small doses. And then, yeah, see how, you know, and then if you journal that and kind of pay attention to it and just see, you know, like I say, we do this a lot with pain. We'll change one thing. We don't want to change mm-hmm. too many because we don't know what's happening. So you change one and right. just kind of track that over time and get an idea. So that's, I, I tend to look at myself that way. And I talk to patients about that too, that even me working with them, I'm trying to figure out how they're going to respond to what I'm doing. And that's always an ongoing experiment. So we just have to track it and modify as we go. Yeah. Well, you know, like you at the Spine Health Foundation, like we are very committed to offering people hope from the freedom from their pain. I mean, because so many people, it's like 100 million people in the country suffer from back and neck pain. And, and that sounds like it's a goal of yours as well. So have you met people that sort of were at their wits end and sort of felt like, I don't know what else to do. I feel like this is never going to go away. Have you met those people and been able to help them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's people like that all the time, especially when you get into these persistent and chronic pain conditions, which our healthcare system, honestly, if you look at the data, is not real great at treating. Uh, Persistent, we used to call them chronic all the time, but we use this word persistent more now, but persistent pain conditions are really challenging. And, um, you know, so you meet a lot of people who have been to multiple different providers. I mean, there's probably people that will listen to this that can identify with that, but they aren't getting uh, places and they're really struggling and down and depressed and fearful and scared about it. Uh, you know, and I think what I'm seeing more of, uh, and I think this is where physical therapy and rehab is changing a little bit, is that we're looking at pain more now uh, from a biopsychosocial standpoint. And, you know, physical therapists are moving in this direction of, especially something like low back pain or neck pain thinking about that pain less as something uh, about the tissues of the body, even though that's the bio of biopsychosocial, the bio is really important. We have to think about the tissues and maybe there's a sensitive tissue, but we know from the research that if pain goes on past three to six months, it's less likely that that pain is due to a tissue in the body because most tissues heal in that amount of time. So, We have to start thinking about psychosocial factors. And, you know, I think people, back to your point of sort of being aware of your body, I don't think people, most people are truly aware of how much their thoughts and emotions can affect their Mm. physical body. Yeah. You know, and I know for me, for instance, I have a a sort of area of pain uh, in the right side of my sort of mid thoracic spine below my shoulder blade that if I'm real, if I get stressed out, it's it's triggered by psychological things. Hmm. If I'm stressed out, that area begins hurting. And it's only because I think about pain so much and I'm studying it and talking to people about it. I think I'm aware of this. So I have sort of a leg up a little bit, but I know that thing is triggered by psychological pain. And then it's exacerbated by mechanical things. Like I'm doing the dishes or vacuuming and it's already flared up. Those things will make it worse, but Mm -hmm. it, it tends to, so I think getting people to think about what are the things in their life that, you know, may be causing them some, some emotional distress, or maybe they have, we think we, sometimes we talk about thought viruses. Maybe they've, you know, you hear people say, Oh, my dad has a bad back. So I'm going to probably have a bad back. And I think there are these beliefs that sometimes get passed down from family members or from your peers or what you read on the internet. And those beliefs can play a huge role in how you feel, you know? And Mm -hmm. I I think we, as therapists, we are constantly trying to help people in a sort of non-threatening way, challenge those beliefs and, change the way they view their body, uh, you know, and sort of move out of uh, of those belief patterns. And it's hard. It's really gradual and slow. And so I I would, you know, I think that's maybe people can think about that when they're stuck at home, maybe they're not sleep providers right now. Be careful what you hear from friends and family, what you read on the internet. There's a lot of nocebic things on that out there, you know, where it's the opposite of the placebo, where something you read or hear can actually cause you physical harm. And I spend a lot of time looking at the nocebo and the, um, that effect on people and really trying to put out messages online that are positive and encouraging and help people because um, there's a lot of those nocebic messages. So I think people just have to be careful what they're reading and just know that it's complex. Pain is really yeah, complex and really everybody's complex. different. And yeah. So yeah. anyway, that was a long answer. Well, no, I think that's such a good point though, because there's no, obviously no quick fix. There's no, mm-hmm. it's not black and white with the body. Um, and unfortunately, uh, part of the, the process is trying different things, going slow, um, and, and having a well-rounded approach. And 
I think maybe people don't realize that at first, but if they can be sort of mentally prepared, okay, like I'm going on a journey and these are the things I have to think about. I think that can make it sort of more successful just to have that in mind as they begin this process of trying to relieve their pain. Um, so, well, it is obvious that you love doing what you do. And I did want to ask you one question just about your online community. Um, obviously it's thriving. Um, you're providing so much great information to people every day on Instagram and Facebook, um, probably also Twitter, um, and, and who knows what YouTube, all the places. Um, so how did you build that community and why do you love, uh, sort of cultivating it and, and being a leader in that space? Yeah, that's an interesting, you know, I spend most of my time on Instagram and that's really where it started and it was sort of by accident. I I didn't ever think it would turn into what it is. I feel really grateful that, um, for where it's at now, but I, uh, when I was teaching kinesiology, I actually, had, this is my third time with this account and I had erased it twice in the past. And oh, wow. I came into class one day and a student came up to me and said, you know, my mom has this sh rotator cuff pain and you had a post and she was doing exercise that was really helpful, but I don't see it anymore. And I, cause I deleted the account. Mm. So I left class that day and just left with the plan that I was going to provide, try to provide something that was helpful to people and do that every day. And I, you know, I'd been at that point, I'd been practicing 10 years. So I had sort of a, a good working idea of what the most common orthopedic conditions were. And I was just going to address those um, in as much detail as I could in a social media post every day. And that was in December of, 2016. So, you know, it's been going for a while now. And I, I just, you know, I think it's so neat to me to be able to see people come into something like Instagram or whatever, somewhere in social media and see a post, read a little bit, get a, gain a little bit of education and just do some basic exercises. Exercise has the best evidence, evidence for musculoskeletal issues. It's better than manual therapy you know, all these other modalities that you see sometimes in PT clinics, exercise and education have the best evidence. And you can do those things on your own if you're motivated to do it. And so I think it's just been really neat for me to see that. And it, and it works worldwide because there, I end up interacting with people around the world who don't have access to providers or they can't afford it, but they have a phone mm -hmm. and they can do exercises. And I think, you know, it, it just, uh, that motivates me and I uh, really enjoy the interaction with people and, and just hearing stories of people doing these, you know, I'm not obviously not evaluating them. So I'm just trying to give sort of information, information that's uh, general. And it's really neat to see that general information help people. So. so did you build this? Did you build it up yourself? Like did you just start using hashtags and it just sort of spread yeah. like wildfire. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, uh, it's all been just organic. I just wow. kind of, yeah, I was using a lot of hashtags. I think that I like so many things in life. I was in the right place at the right time. I probably mm -hmm. was only the fourth or fifth PT at that time who was really working hard on and it. And you, didn't you know. led the way then, because there's a lot now. There's a lot of people out there on Instagram um, that have really large followings in the physical therapy community. I didn't yeah. realize that until. I started working with the Spine Health Foundation, and as I started researching, I was like, "This is people are looking for stuff on here." It makes sense, oh. though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes you realize how much of an how big of an issue pain really is. I Absolutely, mean, pain injuries. It's yeah. If you look now, there's hundreds of PTs doing this, so it's mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It was really just probably a handful in the beginning, and I think it was just valuable information, and I was in the right place at the right time because really, what I'm putting out there people think that having a large following means you're really special. I, I, it doesn't really, it just means mm -hmm. that you like what, I just like what I'm doing and I'm consistent about putting information right. out. I think right place at the right time. And it's all these factors kind of coming together. It's not like the materials really this mind boggling. It's just kind of <laughs> traditional orthopedic PT. So, well, it's good. You're obviously putting it out there in a way that people can really comprehend and utilize um, in a fashion that works for their lives. So, um, Dr. Walter, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your insight and your information. I'm so glad we were able to make this happen. And um, we hope that we can keep in touch with you and everybody. Visit RehabScience.com for more information on what Dr. Walters is doing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Erica. It was great to be on. Thanks again.